Welcome to Episode 6 of the Untamed Podcast. I'm your host, Lou Urich, Certified Eating Psychology Coach, Body Image Mentor, and Life Coach on a mission to wake, shake, and fangirl women everywhere to be who they are, unashamed and absolutely untamed. This podcast is for anyone who is ready to find freedom, break rules, shed labels, think outside of the box, and live beyond limits. No matter who you are or how you identify, you are welcome here. So join me as I air and share my conversations with inspiring friends who are challenging stereotypes, leading the charge, and changing the world. For more information on today's guests and the subjects we discuss in the show, check out the show notes at untamedpodcast.com. Untamed listeners, I am very excited to introduce you to our guest, Lolly Galvin, and her work with the Dignity Project, Philly Street Cuts, and the homeless community in Philadelphia and all around the United States. But before I do that, as usual, a few very quick announcements. The first announcement is thank you again, my gratitude for all of you who have reached out with comments, feedback, support. I'm so appreciative of it all absolutely grateful. I also did receive some feedback that said, hey, you know, when I listen in my headphones, I can only hear the interviewer in one ear and the interviewee in the other. And I think I fixed that. So I think I've got it switched from stereo to mono. So you're hearing both voices in both ears. If you happen to listen to this podcast on headphones through Stitcher or iTunes or something like that, you're on the go. I apologize that it wasn't clear earlier, but I think that I've got it worked out I know I said in the first episode, I am new at this, and so I'm learning the technology along with you, and I so appreciate the grace and kindness with which you guys have been giving me feedback. Most of the episodes are recorded on Skype, so short of giving a disclaimer every single episode about background noise, about glitches, some skips, and technological problems that happen through Skype from time to time because it's not always the most reliable... I'll just let you know now, we do interview through Skype, and there's some things that I can't quite fix. So while I try to make this as enjoyable of a listening experience for you as possible, I hope that in the aspects and areas where I can't, that the guests, the education, the knowledge, and the inspiration that we're getting helps to cover over any of those little sound and technological issues that we might have. If you'd like to be a part of the Untamed community, there's plenty of places that you can go to get connected and to stay involved. First of all, untamedpodcast.com is going to have show notes. It's going to have pictures and additional information on each of the guests. So definitely head over there to get more information about them and learn how you can stay connected with them, but also where you can find resources to the things that we talk about in the show. So links to videos, to other podcasts, possibly to articles and information that we discuss as a part of each episode. Those will all be in the show notes, both on iTunes and at untamedpodcast.com. There, you can also sign up for the Untamed newsletter, where you'll be the first to hear about upcoming guests, get behind-the-scenes media content and additional information, and just stay in touch with me and learn about what's coming down the pipeline for the Untamed podcast. Also, we have an Untamed Facebook community. There's hundreds of people already there talking about the show, talking about their life, talking about any and everything in between, and you are welcome there. There's links to the Untamed Facebook group again on untamedpodcast.com or on Facebook. You can just go to facebook.com slash groups slash I am untamed and you should find it. Community and connection are very important to me, so I'd love for you to join us. I like staying in touch. And again, you can reach out to me through email, through comments, social media, Instagram at louieats.com. And all of my links are always in the show notes as well. So stay connected because I want to get to know you. If you want to do me a solid, do me a favor, share this podcast with your friends, share it on social media, suggest it to your family members, go ahead any which way that you can or that you'd like to share, post, repost, get these guests and their messages out into the ears of other people. Also, if you'd like to leave a positive rating and review on iTunes, I would absolutely appreciate that. Positive ratings and reviews do help other people to get access and get untamed podcasts into their ears. So when they're searching keywords or looking for something along the subject matters of what we've talked about on the show, they can find us and meet our guests and connect with them further. 
That's it for announcements. Now I'd love to introduce you to Lolly. When we recorded this episode, it was snowing for both of us, a snowy March day, and we both had snow outside of our windows while we were chatting about Lolly and the work that she's doing in the world. So it was a really beautiful experience to be face-to-face with Lolly through Skype video and to have this conversation with her, and it's absolutely my pleasure to bring it to you all now. Lolly Galvin is the founder of Dignity Project and Philly Street Cuts. In 2016, she took to the road and completed the Dignity Tour. This was a crowdfunded adventure where she lived in a van for one month while stopping in 14 U.S. cities to provide conversation and essentials to homeless individuals. Back in Philadelphia, she's continued to share the stories of the people she meets along the way. Lolly is a believer in creating humanity where you wish to see it through simple acts. She's a humanitarian, a free thinker, an inspiring woman, and she's sharing her experience and stories with us right now. Hi, Lolly, and welcome to the show. Hello. I did. I'm doing good. Yeah. I did introduce you at the beginning of the show. However, I always love for the guests to introduce themselves in their own words, kind of say who they are what they're doing in the world, what they're all about. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the listeners. Absolutely. So my name is Lolly Galvin. I am founder of Dignity Project. And basically, I am about, I guess, creating connection, but more so focus on homeless people and creating that connection. But eventually, you know, after reading some of the things I post, I hope that it inspires connection beyond just homeless people as well. So I think that it does. I, I'm a follower of your work. Obviously, this is how that we, this is how we connected in the first place. And you inspire me all the time, every day, with the things you post, not just about your work with the homeless, but also about your worldview. And I know I just had mentioned that to you off the air. I am curious though about Dignity Project. What is it? What do you do? What is your work in the world? Your day in and day out. What does that look like? So basically, it's just going out and giving what I have at the time. So literally what I have then. It could be food. We could be doing um, haircuts. We do do street cuts right on the side of the street for homeless people. Um, It just depends who I'm with and, uh, you know, what we have. But mainly it's about sitting down next to people, talking to them, learning from them. And I share my worldview as I go along because I'm learning in this process too. So I share what I learn and what people teach me. And I want to show that you can learn so much just from sitting next to someone that you don't know. So if you had to summarize the Dignity Project in a few sentences, like what you do, your work in the world, what would you say it is? It's a movement of connecting with homeless people who feel isolated, basically. So it's going to the population of people who are the most ignored, the most isolated, and, you know, engaging with them and learning and, you know, taking part in their lives. Yeah, I love I love your focus on connection. And I can tell that your work comes from this place of mutual respect and dignity. Yeah, really honoring the lives of other people. And so it doesn't come from this place of like guilt, or feeling like you have to or, you know, trying to just check something off on some resume, it really comes from a heart centered place for you. At least that's what I notice. So what got you into this work? Like what inspired you to be like, yes, this is what I want to be doing? Well, it wasn't so, you know, down direct path for sure. Um, I raised money on an app. Do you know the app Periscope? Yes. It's kind of obsolete now, but for a minute, you know, people would go on and broadcast and I just thought it was an interesting app and I decided to go on there and in like 15 minutes, 7,000 people were watching me broadcast from my living room, which I thought was totally bizarre, but I was like, let me see if there's something to this. So I tried to raise $500 to do random acts of kindness from people that I had no idea who they were. They were just viewing me. I had no idea. And in three days, I met the goal. And the first uh, random act was taking a homeless guy named Tom out to lunch. And I shared that on my private social media pages, and it just spread from there. So so what was that experience like, your first experience relating to a homeless person, more than just passing them on the street or like throwing them a dollar or some food? You actually sat down with him. You took, You went out to lunch with him, and you related to him as another human. So what was that like? Yeah, that's the thing. So I've definitely given a dollar here, like I'm sure you have and other people have and, you know, given food and just quickly passed by. But I never actually until I was 31 years old, sat down and talked to a homeless person. So it was, you know, and again, that was something I wanted to look at, because that means I'm guided to do something like this. So 
I um, was very nervous when I was going up to him, which was unusual because I don't have much of a problem talking to people. But I was like, what is he going to say? How is he going to react? Is he going to let me take photos? Is he going to let me share this? Because I wanted to share what I was learning because I was learning at that time. So, and I still am. So, um, his reaction was just like, yeah, let's go. And we just had lunch and connected. It was amazing. And he was very, very, um, relatable. He was a relatable person. And I just ran into him after over a year, about two weeks ago. And that was absolutely amazing. So I saw that on social media, you posted a picture like, Hey, this is yeah, Tom, him. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're like this is Tom. This is the first guy that I ever, connected yeah. with. I thought that was really, really special. What is it about connecting with the homeless community? What is it about that that's so important? Well, I think it's important to talk to people that don't have the same resources as you, don't live the same life as you. And I think that um, you can learn so much from just putting yourself in their world and immersing yourself in that world. And it changes your perspective naturally just on what you have. You know, um, you said I don't go out there with guilt and I, I don't, I don't come home and feel like, Oh my gosh, I'm in a house right now. I'm talking to you on my Apple computer. You know, I'm, I, I don't feel that guilt. I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. And so I can go out there and do for these people and connect. And, um, it's not an obligation. It's something that is a privilege to me. So. Yeah. And I think that makes all of the difference doing something again, because you feel like, this conviction or like you aren't worthy of your Apple computer or your home is a very different spirit than going out and being like, oh, but if we're really all one, if I am connected, if I'm just as much much a part of this person's story as they are, and they're just as much a part of mine, there's this whole different relationship that happens because you become peers, you're mutuals, instead of you like having you're it's not like you're the only person that has something to offer in mm-hmm. this in this exchange. So what do you receive out of relating to the homeless community on a daily basis? What sort of gifts do you have in your life because of this? Lots of wisdom, lots of wisdom from people who have been through it, um, for sure. Right now, helping John has been, um, which I'm sure you know if you follow along, has been an extremely amazing experience because He's the first person I met on the streets that I evolved with and went on a journey with. So um, I'm learning a ton from him. But I just learn from everyone I meet every day, just sitting there learning from people who are in survival mode, who are in, they don't think of, you know, last year or last week. They don't think of the future. They just think they're extremely mindful people. And you can learn a lot from people um, that are in that situation. And it, it just permeates into your daily lives. Yeah, I want to get back to John a little bit later because I do want to talk about his story. I think I have a lot of listeners who probably haven't heard of him, don't know all that's gone on between the two of you and between him and really your community that you have and your followers who have taken him under their wing and been drawn to him. So I I do want to talk about him. But first, I want to sort of dispel some of the myths about homelessness because I think that that's really important. So I'm just going to throw out some things that people say about homelessness, and I'd love for you to help me to debunk them. But I can't guarantee you that I'm going to debunk all of them, but I will definitely talk about all of them for sure. So there's this idea that homelessness is the fault of the person who is homeless, right? That they have somehow done something to get themselves there. And Mm -hmm. for it's my understanding that for a large majority of homeless people, that's actually not the case. Well, you know, I've heard a lot of stories, you know, to be honest, I've heard a lot of stories from a lot of people. So it's very hard to me for me to speak in general terms because I've, I've sat and talked to so many different people. Are some people out there because of the decisions they've made? Absolutely. Um, are some people out there because they had no one else? And that is the commonality that I see with a lot of homeless people. They just didn't have the family that you or I would have to fall back on if, you know, something came up financially, whatever it may be. Um, someone to bring them in. They just don't have that. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's a wide spectrum of why people are out there, but I don't think that's the important part. I think the important part is learning from these people and connecting with these people and sharing their stories and realizing that we've all made similar mistakes. We've all had different circumstances and really there's not a lot separating us between each other. Yeah, I think that's the point, and I'm glad that you brought that up. It's not the fact that maybe some of them didn't make a decision or a series of decisions that led them to this place, but it's that in making those decisions, like we all do, right, because we all make decisions that might seem foolish or self-destructive in retrospect or maybe not our brightest moment, but, but most of us have a support system. We have a financial support system, a, a family support system, friendships, relationships, where 
our next wrong decision won't put us out on the street necessarily. Absolutely. But there's that common thread between most of the homeless community that they didn't have that. They didn't have that safety net. They didn't have anybody there to say like, hey, you're you know, in a bad situation right now, come and live with me or here's some money to get you through or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. They just didn't have that little, exactly like that string along to different people that they could kind of get back on their feet. Once you're out on the street, it is very, very hard to leave that life. It just becomes your life. It's very, very difficult. So. Yeah. And I like what you shared about the fact that there's not really much separating us from homelessness. It's, you know, it's one medical diagnosis or one lost job or one child who gets sick. And so you're paying for their medical bills or their care or a car accident. There's any number of things that can happen. Yeah, and I've seen people with those stories, many of the stories that you just mentioned out on the street. And it, it is just one, you know, one loss of a job. And here I am, you know, I can't pay my rent. It just got worse. Like you said, there was no help in between. And this is what my situation is right now. So you know, there's some really, really sad stories out there. And I think there's also this idea that homeless people are uneducated, but really they run the gamut, right? Just like you or I, there's people who are college graduates. Well, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of homeless people with college degrees, but beyond that, I think homeless people are educated in a much more different way. And um, as someone who has like a traditional college degree, I don't think you can compare four years of sitting in a university to four years of being homeless. You know, the the kind of education that these people have is much different than the typical person, the way they speak, the way they engage, the way they, their guard is not there. There's none of that ego in between the two of you is, is a different kind of learning experience. So um, while they were on the gamut of being educated in that way, for sure they have a different education that I've learned along the way that is unbelievable and a different awareness of the world and awareness of people. You know, I've heard somewhere along the way, maybe one of the podcasts you're on that you're like not a huge college. I mean, if people want to go to college, cool, <laughs> but it's not for everybody. And I'm like, she's my girl because I feel the same way. I'm like, yeah, it's I know. Sort I of go like highway robbery if you actually don't really want to do anything with it, you know? Yeah, I know. You probably watched me on Josh's podcast and he's <laughs> he's like, you get to bash college and he can't say some of the things that I say, but it's not that I'm bashing it. I'm just saying like, you know, I think people get so caught up in. I need to have this degree in order to do this. And I have to do this, you know, and I have to be in school for all these years. And sometimes your education comes from just doing it. You know, I have no education in the nonprofit field. I have no, and I'm talking formal education in any of the things that I'm doing, but I went out there, put myself out there and I went there as an active listener and an active learner. And I continue to do so. And I think that that too is being a student just in a different way. And I think we need more life students. Yeah, we don't value that human experience as much as we do this institutional experience. And I think that that's to our detriment for sure. I have three young kids. And when people always ask them, like, what do you want to be? I'm like, they're five, eight and nine. Like, they want to be kids. Like, what yeah. do you mean? What do they want to be? Like, I always tell them, like, you don't have to tell people what you want to be when you grow up or like that you want to go to college. Like, I don't, I actually don't care if you get a D on your math test. Like, I just don't care because I want you, we always tell our kids. Mine. Yeah, it's like we always tell our kids, we're like, if you are kind and compassionate to people and you do your best, that's fine with me. And so I love the idea of you bringing that more into people's focus through your social media accounts and stuff that like there's this whole school of life that we miss out on when we follow the status quo this one certain way. It's great to have that mindset for your children, because I don't think that um, college is for everyone. And I think that a lot of people could start doing things young. I mean, I see some young kids doing, I just spent a day doing a gig with a nine-year-old girl who, uh, Chloe from Chloe cares, her nonprofit. Um, and her and her mom are here. She was speaking at Rutgers and it's like, it's just unbelievable what young people can accomplish. And I think that sometimes holding this one track way of accomplishing something holds people back. Mm -hmm. We can stifle their creativity and their real wisdom through some of this conventional stuff. So I love that. I love that part of your story and your mission, too. When it comes to the homeless community, a lot of another misconception or something else that I hear often in the circles that I'm in is this whole idea of like, well, why can't they just go to a shelter and then, you know, get a job and then get a house? Like there's this whole idea of like pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. And why is that not happening? <laughs> well, OK. So anyone that has that idea has never seen, that's one thing I am just, I hear a lot of people talk about, um, as far as, um, the shelters, homeless shelters in Philadelphia, 
the main reason people are sitting on the streets is because they do not feel safe. Um, and I'm not knocking shelters. There's people who do amazing work in shelters. So that's not the point of what I'm saying. I'm just telling you what people tell me when I ask them, it's, you know, snowing, like, like we're talking about right now outside. Why are you sitting on a street corner? Why are you not in a shelter? That's common. That was what a common person would think, right? You know, there's a lot of overcrowding. There's a lot of danger. There's a lot of theft. Um, some people just like to feel by themselves, you know, not enclosed. Some people say it feels like prison or reminds them of prison or, or, or things like that. So shelters, are not what people envision them to be. As far as housing, uh, to give you an idea, and I know you're gonna talk about John later, but it's been five months and John is still looking for housing here. Uh, as, a, as a senior citizen, as someone who's highly disabled, and he has not been able to, even with um, some strings that were kind of tried to pull with city council, he has not been able to do that. So the pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality, I wish were true. Because then people that were out there, you know, okay, they've in a way made a choice or a resignation to be homeless, but it is very, very difficult to do the things that you listed um, without a support system, without help, without an address, without so many things that I could go on and on about. But it is not that easy, and I wish it was, like I said. Yeah, again, that's what I often tell people is in any context when there's this whole bootstrap idea brought up, I'm like, if you have boots, maybe that works, you know, but if you don't have the boots, which we could call the support system, that safety net, that relationships with people, then yeah, like what, there is nothing to pull yourself up by. But I think there's a lot of propaganda out there right now that the government just hands people without money, money, here's a bag of money, you know, here's a house. This is just not reality. I mean, you know, unfortunately, I don't know where this idea is coming from um, or if it's just something that people are repeating and not putting this because I would not know this either. You know, unfortunately, I got and I don't mean it unfortunately because these people do great work. But unfortunately, I got into this social work kind of environment and I saw how hard it is for these people that are working the system and the people that are involved in the system. And it just needs an entire like demolition and to be rebuilt. But that's that's why I don't get involved with those type of things. So <laughs> I'm with you. I totally agree. Like burn that thing down and start yeah. again, making right people on. yeah. No longer enslaved to it, but actually truly empowered and yes. supported for sure. I agree. And that'll take the work and the wisdom of people like you and me and so many others who and people who actually have a passion to be involved in the politics of it. Absolutely. On your social media, you often tell personal stories of, of people that you're working with, of people that you encounter on the streets. What do you think the value is in personal storytelling? Well, I think that people love stories, naturally. I love stories. You love stories. We all do. And we like to follow a story and we like to hear someone's story, especially someone who we would not actively approach ourselves. So when I'm sharing the story of someone sitting on that street corner, it's it's them having a voice and them saying a little bit about themselves. You know, I don't do a full interview, but just enough to give you a little bit of a window into, you know, their mindset or the interaction we had, whatever sticks out to me, I just naturally write and share. And then people get to see a little bit of that person. Yeah. So I, it just shows a relatability. It shows people who that person is. It, it shows us, you know, the, the main thing that I am trying to show, which is that we are all so much more alike than we are different. Yeah, it shows that connection. And of course, I'm going to put all the links to your social media so that we're not just talking about it. The listeners can actually go and observe it and dig into it themselves. But I love it because I'll be like, oh, you know, hey, that reminds me of my dad or like, oh, this person reminds me. I like that, too, you know, or I like their spunk or their personality. And you just start to relate to people. Funny, a lot of people write me and they're like, that reminds me of my dad, that that guy reminded me of my uncle. Just like you said, it's a relatability factor. And I'm so glad to hear that from you because it's a relatability factor of like, oh, that person sitting there is a person, you know, yeah. and and they're funnier, they're quirkier, they're this, or I like this quality. And, you know, for each person, something, some people resonate different with different people. And I love reading the comments for that reason as well. Yeah, it lessens the gap again, and is, which is exactly what you're trying to do between us and them. And instead, it's just us, the collective, like all of us. And I really, I really love that about the work that you do and appreciate that so much. One of the things that comes up a lot, the concerns that people have when they either consider serving the homeless themselves or the work that you do, they go, oh, my gosh, isn't that so dangerous? What is your response to that? Uh, yeah, I... I hear this a lot, especially when I did the Dignity Tour, which was um, I went and lived in a van for a month and went to 14 cities across the country 
So before I left, I was getting a ton of DMs about don't go here, don't do this, you know, um, from certain people and from some family that it was dangerous. Um, I've not experienced a dangerous situation with homeless people. They're not generally out to like get you or, you know, attack you. They're just trying to survive in most cases at the same time you know I follow my intuition um, I know the areas that I'm going to very much I'm a highly aware person you know so that's part of it as well but as far as danger I just it's not a dangerous thing to go and talk to a person sitting somewhere I just haven't had that experience so it's hard for me to understand as far as being scared or apprehensive I understand that fully but um, you're gonna be okay give it a try and trust yourself. You know, that takes the, what people are really saying when they say that is I don't trust myself to make a good judgment call or I don't trust myself. And I've been there, but you have to get past that and get outside of your comfort zone and say, okay, like I can make this decision. I can talk to this person. And the more you do it, the more confidence you get and the more you're less attached to the outcome and the expectation of how that person is going to react. And you're just more concentrated on being present and connected to the person. I love what you just said, and I would love to expound on it a little bit as well. This idea of being attached to the outcome, that has come up for me personally. Uh, one of the things that really, really bothers me, and maybe it doesn't bother you, so you can you can let me know, but one of the things that bothers me is these groups who go out, you know, they, they go out on the streets for, you know, a day, 30 minutes, you know, whatever, it's like a trip, and they go and they throw sandwiches or money or religious tracts or whatever, at people and they walk away, you know, no real relationship, no real relating. And so I'm curious about that in terms of, is there really value in that? Is it doing anything? Like, I wonder how the homeless community actually feels. Okay. I see, I will be doing a haircut on the side of the street I, to be, um, I don't cut hair, but I mean, one of my stylists will be cut, be cutting hair and I'll be sitting there and someone will come up or we're out to give whatever it is. And we're talking to that person sitting with them and someone will come and just give a dollar, give whatever, and just run off. Um, it happens all the time. Um, as far as groups and giving like prayer things out or what, what, you know, sandwiches and just leaving, I see that often as well. And it's a very, very nice gesture. I really believe it is a nice gesture and it can start something. It can plant the seed in you to do more. So I would never say it's a bad thing, but you're overlooking the whole part of talking to that person. Sometimes, uh, we were out a couple weeks ago and a woman was asking us about a bunch of questions about the the girl we were talking to right in front of her. And my friend Britt actually said to her, you know, why don't you ask Ashley? She's right here. And he wasn't saying it in a rude way. But I mean, that that's the level that people are with this. You know, it's just so, so blocked up. So, um, yeah, if you're not having the connection, I think you're missing you're depriving yourself and that person of a huge part of the equation. Just giving is nice. Don't get me wrong, but giving yourself, giving part of your story or giving your ear to someone is a much, much bigger gift, much bigger than money as I don't give money, but if I did, it would be much bigger than money. Yeah. It's like, it's a mutual gift too, because I can hear you. I know because I follow you and I follow the work that you do that you receive just as much, if not more in your mind than what the homeless community and your, your homeless friends receive from being with and interacting with you. So there's that mutual connection that you miss, but also, you know, the whole namesake of your work, the Dignity Project, I think you rob the community of dignity when you just throw food, throw prayers, throw something at them, don't look them in the eye, don't really have that human connection, and you walk away. And that to me is such a disservice. You know, yes, thank you for your donation. Thank you for your gift. It's not to be ungrateful for anything, of course, but wow, like you have the opportunity to bring dignity to people. Well, that's people feeling the shame and the embarrassment of it. And they're feeling what they feel when they look at that person. So it blocks them from the connection that they can get. That's what that is. I don't think that they're trying to be uh, you know, malicious or ignore people. I think that they feel so much, you know, so many emotions when they look at that person and then they project that onto that person and they just totally pretend like the, the person is not there at all because they want to avoid that. So the more you just crack through that and crack through that, it just becomes second nature and you feel, you see that it's not dangerous. These are not a group of people that you have to be fearful of or watch out or watch your back, you know, around. It's not, it's not that type of environment. 
you know, you're reminding me of there's this quote, it's something along the lines, if, if we let go of fear and hate, we'd have to face pain. And it's almost like what you're saying is like, Absolutely. for people, for people to come and interact with the homeless community on a very personal level means you're facing you are experiencing with them, you're hearing the very real stories of their pain. And you're seeing it, you're seeing the brokenness of humanity and of our system. Don't know what you're gonna walk into, you might walk into a jovial person who's having a great day, you might walk into a woman like I walked into a couple weeks ago who just had her throat sliced. You might walk into somebody who told you they just got raped. You might, you know, you might walk into anything. It, you don't know how the interaction is going to go. Um, and if you really connect with someone, it can go very, very deep. So I think a lot of people keep it, just like you said, very surface, very shallow, so that they don't have to see that pain or connect anything that they, they feel like they can't hear. Yeah. You know, and that's what I practice when I sit next to these people is hearing these things that seem extreme or very sad and sitting with that person and in their moment with them and not trying to fix it or change it, just listening. And that's a that's a very difficult practice. I'm learning. So, yeah, listening is such an important gift that we can give to other people. And I'm curious because we're sort of heading in this direction. One of the questions that I had to ask you that I also asked my guest, Sarah Lee, who works with Project Consent. She's the founder of Project Consent. So she is working with sexual assault victims and rape victims on a daily basis. And I was like, wow, how do you take care of yourself? How do you fill yourself back up? And because it is, it's very hard to hear these stories from the homeless community. And they're sharing, like you said, like, oh, I got my throat slashed, or I just got raped, or, you know, those sort of difficulties that you're seeing. It's not always that heavy. Sometimes it's very nice. And, you know, but it like, it just depends. It really depends on who you run into. But yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Because you can run into some people, like you said, who are happy, who just want to, yeah. you know, talk and hang out and want to tell you. About they they want to escape the feeling that they're homeless. So they just want to, like you were saying, they just want to talk. They want to banter. So it really depends. But if you get deep in there, sometimes it is hard. So, yeah, you do have to take care of yourself. Absolutely. What do you do to take care of yourself? What are your go to methods? Well, as you can see, I'm a consistent hydrator. <laughs> yeah. This morning yeah. I did a little meditation. Um, I did some yoga this morning. Uh, travel. You know, taking care of myself, resting, trusting my body on days where I'm just like, I don't want to be out there. I don't want to do this today. Actually listening to myself instead of forcing myself, which is my normal go-to, go, go, go. Just learning to listen to myself, my voice. I like that you keep bringing up this idea through different answers that you've given of trusting your intuition, because it's something that I teach my clients a lot is to get in touch with that inner knowing to guide them presently in every moment. So, you know, you, you're never without that intuition. If you're tapping into it, like you said, some days you're going to feel really charged and energized to get out there in the streets. And some days you're going to know that you need to rest or you need to stay in or whatever the needs are. If you listen to that intuition. Absolutely. If you're coaching people to get in touch with their intuition, then that's the best kind of coach there is because you want that person to get in touch with what they have inside. So, and then you can guide yourself and learn to, you know, you can learn how to take care of yourself because when you ask the question, how do you take care of yourself? Some people don't even know how to do that. So to, to learn what you want and what you need, you have to really exercise that intuition. So that's part of it for sure. Agreed. And it's always a practice. So you yes. just keep doing yes. it. Some days I'm off. <laughs> One other one other misconception, maybe it's not a misconception, but one other common conversation is this idea of don't give a homeless person money. They're going to use it for drugs and alcohol. What are your thoughts about that? Do you know what really happens with money when people give money? Um, I don't. Uh, I know I do not give money because of the fact that I see a lot of the same people. They know who I am. And if I give money to one person, it's, you know, the homeless community is pretty tight like that. So that's not going to work for me. Um, however, you know, when it comes to people saying that about money, that's fine. You know, if that's your view, you can always get someone a gift card, um, you know, to get food, you can buy them lunch. You don't even have to give them money as far as, um, buying drugs and alcohol. They might, I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. That might happen. But once you give your money away, I kind of feel like it's then that person's decision. And I, I can't say exactly what people do with the money. I know a lot of people in Philly, um, we have a hotel, I think, that runs it's like a hourly rate hotel kind of thing. So some people will save up for a couple of hours at a hotel and they'll save their vouchers to show people that that's what they're actually doing. Um, aside from that, I haven't really seen anything else. 
No, I was just curious because there is this whole idea of like, don't give them money. They all use drugs and drink alcohol. And yeah. so, and I have my own feelings about that too. One, I know that not every homeless person is a drug user or an alcoholic. Two, I also know that given the circumstances that they're living in and faced with every day, I'm not going to judge how they choose to escape what is a really difficult situation. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, the more you see how this life is, the more, you know, you're like, wow, how could you sometimes I actually think how could I not use drugs and live on the street? I really do because it's just so hard and terrible and lonely and cold and just miserable. I mean, it's miserable. And I talk with John a lot about that, um, about how he did that because it's just so hard. So to, to judge what people do with the money or to really inquire, first of all, you're probably giving like two or $3. So let's be honest, like you're not, you know, you're not going to like stir up their habit or whatever, but like I said, if you want to give something more personalized, I've heard people, you know, homeless people, I've seen them in beautiful jackets and they'll be like, oh, someone bought this for me. You know, someone just got this for winter. You can do something like that if you if you have money and means and you feel like giving them a bunch of money is not the right solution. You know, just go, like I said, once again, it goes back to your intuition. What does that person ask for? You know, they seem like they're truly in need, that kind of thought. Yeah, my dad taught me growing up, he always used to say, if God wanted us to hold on to our money, he would have put handles on it. So I'm very much like, easy come, easy go, right? Too, like, me too. But in, in this situation, I know you said you don't give money. You have dignity bags and you hand out you know, certain supplies. What sort of things specifically are you handing out and giving to the homeless community? We give like all essentials, like shampoo, soaps, all of that, toothbrush, toothpaste, nails, clippers. Uh, hand warmers right now definitely uh this winter we did keep your friends warm which was the hashtag and we did 306 sleeping bags which was unbelievable my apartment was overtaken it was ridiculous but the reception was so nice because it was like an actual sleeping bag like covered your head it was basically we were giving people beds you know um so for spring, we're doing a spring drive and we're doing, we're going to start having some more creative things like um, sidewalk chalk and some puzzles and those kind of things. Try to stimulate minds and um, make it less about survival and more about thriving, have some conversation starters, some fun events. That's what I'm looking forward to. Some fun spring. I, I love when the weather changes, of course, because it makes my life easier. Winter, winter is very miserable for me. Um, so I, yeah. We have a lot and we give out a lot of different things. It just, it depends. And you also do, you talked about it a few times already in the interview, this Philly street cuts. Could you explain that? I know what it is, but I'd love the listeners to hear. And also I'd love for you to talk about why it's so important. So yeah, Philly street cuts we do. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that in that whole thing that I do, but we always do Philly street cuts year round. So that's probably why I forgot they exist. Uh, they slow down in winter, of course, because people are like bundled up and they don't want to take off of their hats and don't care about their hair as much. But basically what we do is we cut people's hair right on the street corner. So we're in center city, Philadelphia. Um, they're sitting there and it's a great demonstration of humanity. We just give them a cut and people are walking by. A lot of people stop. A lot of people take pictures. A lot of people engage and that, that barrier between um, them and the person sitting there is kind of erased. And it's it's a really, really nice thing. I mean, aside from the fact that that person's being touched for the first time in so long, they're being talked to. And, you know, when, when you're getting your hair cut, there, it is like an intimate situation. There's great conversation that flows. And, you know, you hear so much about that person. So we do them regularly. Um, there's a bunch of volunteer stylists that come out. We bring our cordless clippers and just walk around and see who wants cuts. And we've done a lot of repeat cuts. It's just been, it's been really, really nice. I like that a lot. I like the idea of that personal touch and interaction because I know I go and get my hair cut probably less often than supposedly my hairdresser would like, right? But four, four times a year or something, yeah. I will go and it is intimate. She'll give me a, a shoulder massage. She shampoos my hair. She cuts my hair. We talk about life. Yeah. And so that is something that people on the on the streets and the homeless community, they don't often get those conversations. They don't get that personal touch. You're totally right. What you're talking about in the salon, it happens on the streets. So to clarify, I saw people doing this online. Joshua Combs, who I posted some posts with him, Mark Bustos, who was doing it in New York. And like I said, I don't cut hair. So I just posted on social media and some girls have come out. So I'll just sit. We'll, we'll sit like it's a salon kind of. I'll sit next to them. She'll cut and we'll do our thing. 
I think that that's awesome. Now, I did see at one time you had at least one person that you spoke of, but maybe there was many who were like, oh, I don't know if I want to get a shave and a haircut because then people might not think I'm homeless and they might not actually help me out. Does that happen often? Well, you know, homeless people have theories about how much money they're going to make and how they're going to make that money. And, you know, you're looking at a busy part of downtown Philadelphia. They're lucky if they're going to make $30 in a day. That's a good day. Um, You know, unless there's a random person that's throwing out a $20 or a $50 bill, which happens sometimes. But most of the time, you know, not not so much. So um, I'm sorry. What was the question on that one? It was basically about how you had had some people I know who you offered a haircut to who were hesitant at first because they worried about that. I'm sorry. I got sidetracked with the money. So basically, like, you know, they want to make the maximum amount of money that they can. And they have all these ideas and they have all these different strategies. So I do hear that. But at the same time, I've heard people that have gotten cuts. John was one of these people and a couple of other people that looked really, really scraggly. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Just completely covered you know, the hair, the beard, everything. And then I would see them later and they were like, you know what, Lolly, you, you were right. They, I, people are more receptive to me. I'm getting, and it's just that they just look less, you know, unapproachable, less scary, even though that's a ridiculous way to describe it. I mean, realistically, that's kind of what's being erased. So yeah, you're, I do hear people say that, but like I said, you know, I, I think that a haircut helps. Yeah. And for the listeners, I think it's so important to to clarify, too, this whole idea of like when the homeless community is talking about like, oh, gosh, you know, but I want to be able to make money and I want people to be receptive to me. This is not some sort of scam or something where they're bringing home thousands of dollars a day and like, ha (laughs) ha, you've been duped. It's really like they get just enough to be able to eat. (laughs) It's so funny you say that because there is um, there's this one video on YouTube with the guy that has been panhandling and he walks in the mansion. Have you ever seen this? No, yeah, I haven't. But I'm going to post the link now yeah. on the show notes to the show. Yeah, I'll, I'll like show it to you. And so like there's there's these kind of things where or the person dressed up as an old woman. I've seen this lady that, that was scamming in New York and she walked into a car. You know, these things, I suppose, do happen, obviously. Um However, I've seen how much money are in their cups and in their pockets and homeless people, like you said, they're not having some racket where they're going home at the end of the day, like, like laughing into money. It's not that type of thing. They're very lucky if they make, like I said, $30 in a day, that is a good day. So, and that's here in Philadelphia. And, and, you know, I've asked people if I, if the person has that kind of vibe, I will ask them, you know, how much do you make out here? That kind of thing when I'm traveling as well. And it's kind of, not the most profitable business, panhandling. Yeah, exactly. And I think that sometimes, I don't know what it is, fear, choosing to look the other way, you know, that intentional blindness that people are like, oh, no, they just want to make money or whatever. And it's like, no, they just actually want to not die <laughs> of starvation. Yeah. Like, or, you know, maybe, maybe get a voucher to go take a shower once every three months or something, you know. And so I think that that's such an important distinction to make. Now, we've brought up John a few times. I know who John is. I'm a big fangirl of John. But I'm wondering if you could introduce him and share a little bit about his story. And another thing I want to clarify to the listeners, the stories that you share, you get permission, you have relationship with with these homeless people. John has given permission, obviously, for you to share his story. And and so when we talk about John, it's because he has been a very open part of of you and the work that you're doing in the world and someone who's willing to share his story. So could you introduce him to our listeners? So I met John through a haircut last year, and he was just kind of this grumpy guy that sat on street corners and, you know, wouldn't really take much that we had to give. And, you know, he wasn't by any means mean, but he was just very closed down, closed off. And I would see him, I did a mini documentary with little things and, um, he was in that documentary as well because he was out that day and I had just seen him multiple times. I would just see him and check in on him and his, his before and after was just so extreme. You know, he looked great, looked years younger. And then I saw him once and he was in a wheelchair and I was like, what are you doing in a wheelchair? And he's like, I got hit by a car. And I was like, that's, that's crazy. Okay. Are you okay? And he's like, you know, I'm not doing so well. Can you, can you try to find me a place to live? I can afford John's, um, one of the rare people who is on, um, SSI disability, who is homeless. Um, very rare to see someone like that. So he's like, you know, I can afford this much a month. Unfortunately it was about $400 a month for his own place, which was kind of not happening. 
Um, and then each time I ran into him, he just was getting worse and worse and worse. And um, finally, I got a message from another homeless person. Um, they will use the library here in Philly to go on Facebook. And she messaged me and said that John was taken to the hospital. Um, but prior to that, for about two weeks, I had been looking for him in some pretty bad areas, asking around for him. People were like, oh, you just missed him by 15 minutes. I was like, oh, my gosh, you know. And she's like, I don't know if he's going to make it. He just doesn't look good. So I went to the hospital, checked in on him. He had a fractured spine and a severe leg infection to the point where he was getting kicked off buses because of the smell coming from his legs. I mean, there was bug. It was just not good at all. And I happened to be traveling. I was going to Europe for two weeks during all of this. So I had to take him out of this hospital um, for certain reasons, move him raise money on a GoFundMe, move him to this hotel. I traveled. One of the stylists, Alicia, bless her heart, took care of him while I was gone. And then he stayed with a friend of mine and then he, Roz, and then he went and got spinal surgery. And it's been an amazing journey. Like he was an active addict when I met him. I just was able to post that. He wanted to share that part of the story, but basically he's able to walk again and the community on Instagram of my followers has been so just warm and welcoming to him. And a lot of people have been, you know, texting him and sending him cards from all over the world. I mean, his story has gone viral and he would tell you every country right now if he could, but yeah, it's gone viral all around. And, you know, it's so amazing to watch him develop and evolve and, and grow and change because getting off the streets is just so much psychologically. And then he's going through this back surgery and he was paralyzed and he's walking again and he's not using anymore. I mean, it's just, it's an amazing journey and you know, John is family to me now. So he's living at a transitional nursing home that the university of Pennsylvania got him into. Thank you for that. And he is being interviewed for housing right now, but he's still in the process. It's a long, long process. I don't know John personally, but I love him. I love the relationship the two of you have together. So I tune in to like the live videos on Facebook oh, cool. and anywhere I can hear the two of you talking. He's so endearing, so kind. And I, I love his personality. He's yeah. fun and funny. So all the listeners, I will post links to how you can connect and how you can meet John and see some of the videos and get to know him and more of his story. But it's definitely worth checking out. Why do you think, Lolly, that the public responded so positively to John, like from the beginning, you know, what do you think it was about this story? Well, I think that it's exactly what you said. John's funny. He has a great sense of humor. He's the kindest soul, you know, even when he has his moments of where his emotions overtake him, it's always in the kindest way. You know, he has good intentions and a good heart. And I think a lot of people saw in John someone that kind of crept through some holes and could have had a much different life. You know, John comes from a prominent family, a prominent area. And, you know, now he's a 57 year old homeless man living on the side of the street. So he's lived quite the life. And I think a lot of people see someone, the, someone they know part of them selves in him, you know, a combination of things. He's just a super relatable, good guy. I mean, when it comes down to it, he's just a good guy. Yeah. Again, back to what we have been talking about all along. It was just that one or a series of a few circumstances that led him to homelessness. His life could have looked very different. He actually talks about that at one point, or you do. I remember you guys were talking about like things could have been very different for him. And the series of events that led to homelessness for him is so relatable because, again, it could happen to any one of us uh, under any number of circumstances. Something could go wrong if we didn't have the support system. And that's for him. Like, his mom died. I'm sure you saw one of the posts. You know, his mom was his last last people he had. And once his mom died, he had no one. And he just kind of started to give up. So, yeah. And recently, you did share this here, as John wanted to share this part of his story. He talked about, and you talked about, knowing that he was at one time an addict and not wanting to share that part of his story, partially, obviously, for privacy, but also because you were worried about the stigma related to that and what people's response would be. Yeah, I mean, said that he had used drugs. I didn't say how frequently he used drugs and how long right. um, because I thought that was his to tell. But also it was a lot of what you said. It was me being uh, withholding that because I was afraid of how people would react in the beginning. OK, here's this guy. He's a heroin addict. You know, he's people just sometimes draw conclusions about people. So I wanted to them to know John first and then 
and it's kind of been a natural thing. Everything that he's put out there, the facts about him, everything I post comes from him or an interaction that I have from him with his blessings. So together we share it and it's been super therapeutic because I feel like John is the kind of person that flourishes with support and he's not had support for so long. So he has support from people online. I'm sure you see he's very active on Facebook. He's now very active on Instagram. And, you know, I think that for people like him that need that, it's, it's an, and we all need some kind of connection. It's been an amazing support to him to have people out there. You know, I mean, we trip out when we see cards that come in from Pakistan or, you know, all these different places from around the world. And he's like, I can't believe that I did this. And I'm like, it was, it was you, you know? So now that people know him and, and he was comfortable enough to say, you know, I want to share this part of my story. People were even more open to him, you know, and I saw people short in that way. They were more open to him. They felt more connected to him and they thought he was more of a hero than he already is to so many people. So I'm glad that he told me it was time to share because he was right. I love this aspect of technology too. It's so great that technology can be used to share stories and to connect people. And we hear often like the negative aspects of tech, but Periscope, how you got started, Instagram, social media, this podcast right here is spreading the message even further. You know, we get we have the opportunity to do that every day through technology. And John has the opportunity to feel supported and to build a relationship in a way that he never could. It's amazing. I think social media is like everything else. It's a tool. It's up to you how you use it. To me, it's an amazing tool. It can connect people from all over the world. Uh, so many people that inspire me in the project and shape the project come from Instagram. I see what they're doing. Um, they inspire me and you know, they cause me to be more creative in that sense. So it's all about how you use it. And for John, this community means so much to him. And you know, the Dignity Project community, if that's what I guess it's called, is a bunch of really passionate people who are super involved with this story. So knowing that he has that support there and someone different for me, it's important to introduce someone to all different school of thoughts. And he has people that he talks to now on a regular basis to give him different opinions than mine. Cause I don't want it to be just my influence on him. You know, I try to be as objective as possible, but I want him to t talk to other people and, you know, let him, himself come out because I think that's what's happening he's coming out of his shell and at 57 he's realizing who he is yeah it's so beautiful I love it we're gonna wrap up a little bit here and get into some of our final questions but for the listeners who are saying hey this is inspiring me I really want to get involved in one way or another with the homeless community in my area with the dignity project what would you advise that they do what are some first steps that somebody who wants to get involved could do do <laughs> do that's it do the first thing you know, the number one message I get online is what, how can I do it? What should I do? And I just say, do it, just go and do it. If you make one sandwich and bring one water and you go and you sit with one person, then you've done it. And then you're good to go. And then if you want to do more, you do more. If it's drawing you there, you know, and it will, but you know, you have to be drawn there yourself. I would just say, do it. Don't overcomplicate it. Um, don't try to make a huge GoFundMe for it or do anything extravagant. Just start small and see if that's even what you're called to do, you know? So I think just going out there and doing step one. And letting it evolve, again, following your intuition, because somebody's work in their area might look very different than the work that you do. It's all just about the, you know, that individual's creativity and their inspiration and where they really feel a connection of going out and serving. So yeah, and you're connected just like with the nine year old Chloe, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And she's nine years old. She's speaking at Rutgers. I'm like, oh, I know. That's crazy. Know. You know, and she's out there doing it. So if a nine year old can do it in her own way with her creativity, then we all can go and make these changes the way that feel best and, and most honest to us, all the while creating dignity and maintaining dignity for the homeless community that gets stripped of that so often. One more question before we go to the final questions is how do you maintain or help to protect the dignity of the homeless community? Because again, you know, you're sharing them on social media. You said people come up and want to take pictures pictures when they're getting their haircuts. Like, where's that line? Again, between education and exploitation, do they give their permission to have their pictures taken? What happens there? Yeah, they give their picture, they give permission to take their pictures. I don't quite understand um, the exploitation of, of sharing these things, but I understand the sentiment. I think the reason I don't understand it is because so many homeless people are so open to photos and they're so open to sharing that I don't understand. And I can always tell when someone feels very passionate about this, that, and I don't mean this in like a demeaning way, that they haven't done much work with homeless people 
I've done what I've done because they're often open books. So to me, I'm like, what's, I'm like, what's the big deal? Like, why are you, you know, where does this thought even come from? But then I step back and I think, okay, um, anyone that's in pictures knows their, their photos being taken, but more so, you know, I explain to them what I'm doing and sometimes they're interested in that. And sometimes they just want to talk, you know, you're, you're talking about who haven't had someone ask them about their life in so long. You were talking about a person who hasn't put their arm around someone and taken a photo. I mean, it takes them a second to put their arm around me and take a photo. So that exploitation thing, I don't necessarily understand that. I'm just trying to show connection and unity. And if you, if you attempted it, you would see that it just kind of flows. It does. And also I think what I'm hearing you say too, is this whole idea of existence, like evidence that they exist, right? Because in so many situations, in so many contexts, the homeless community is just ignored, swept under the rug. This is like pictures, documentation, this real tangible thing that like, Hey, I'm here. I exist. Exactly. Don't worry about taking pictures. I think people should worry about the fact that they're not taking pictures, that these people aren't engaged, you know? Um, and of course I know that some people tag me in things where, you know, there's videos of homeless people having to do things for money or getting exploited and all those kind of things. So I'm sure that exists, but if you're doing it with, you know, just by telling stories, I don't think that there's anything wrong in that. And it just helps people connect. Yeah, for sure. And in all things, just preserving and really showcasing the dignity of every human, of all of us and the collective, I think is so important. So now without further ado, I'd love to get into the closing questions for our show. The name of the show is Untamed. It's for women who are doing all sorts of amazing things in the world, challenging the status quo, changing lives. I'm wondering for you, what does it mean to be an untamed woman? Be an untamed woman, I think, is to trust your instinct and to go out there and follow the voice that is guiding you. So it's not that crazy of an answer, but just following your voice. And and I guess that's kind of being untamed in today's society, right? Listening to yourself. Right. Yeah. Not having to follow all the social constructs and rules around you. Is there any circumstance or relationship or aspect of your life that you really want to be more untamed? Any aspect in my life that I want to be more untamed? All right. I'm not, I'm going to be honest. I'm not a super like tame. All right. By tamed, what do we mean by tamed? Well, more wild and free where you want to let loose and follow that inner knowing more. I, I always want to follow. I'm very passionate about following that inner knowing more for sure. As far as like loose and free, I have to be like totally full disclosure. I already am that way kind of naturally. So I'm not too tightly wound. There's not much I'm working on in that area. I'm I'm lucky in that way. I guess. I guess I'm lucky. Sometimes, sometimes it's not, but you know. No, I'm not surprised at all. And I find it refreshing. Do you have a Shiro? So like a woman in your life who you really look up to, who you admire, or who has somehow helped you and inspired you? Hmm, that's a good question. See, I have so many. They're usually in like books that I read. I'm a huge, huge reader. And I love anyone that writes for Hay House. I Do you know Hay House? Wayne Darnold? I love yes, those people. Yeah. I'm such a sucker in that way. Um, so I don't have a specific woman that I'm like, Oh, you know, she changed my life, but there's so many women that I meet that are doing amazing things and so many people for that matter. So I don't have anyone super specific. I'm sorry. Oh no, that's fine. Uh, The Hay House, female Hay House authors, I guess. Go get (laughs) them. Have you read Rebecca Campbell? I have. Yes. Yeah. Rise, Sister Rise. I just read that one and loved it. And my friend Katie Dalebout wrote Let It Out, which is all about journaling really? for Hay House. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm a huge fan. Anything they put out, I'm like, oh, okay, fine. There's two Shiro's right there. You there. Go. Okay. Do you have a favorite quote, motto, or mantra? Um, I have lots. Like I read a quote and I'm like, this quote speaks to me. And then 10 minutes later, I'm like, no, it's this quote. So I have a lot. Um, You know, my mantra is just to have fun in life, enjoy your life, and try to do some good while you're here. I mean, that's kind of cliche and cheesy, but that's that's all I got. Is there anything you want more of in your life? More of? I want to travel more, but that's something that I always want in my life. And I'm very, very fortunate that I am able to travel as much as I am. But to be honest, yes, more travel. More travel. Anything you want less of? Um, no. No, I wouldn't want less or more of anything right now. I pick like the raddest guests because the last two of you have been like, no, I want it all. Like there's nothing I want less of. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I have to take the bad things to get, you know, the good. Exactly. Uh, What do you do for fun when you're not working with the homeless community, when you're not doing Dignity Project? Not that those things aren't fun too, but what kind of things do you do for fun? 
Um, yeah. So for fun, I hang out with my animals. I have a bunch of them that I'm sure you've seen crawling around. Um, I, you know, I like to go out once in a while. I love food. So going out, trying new restaurants around here. Um, and like I said, traveling, that's my, my number one passion. My husband and I always come to Philly to eat at veg. Oh, I love veg. So yeah. You have to go to V street though. I dare say it's even better. I heard that. I heard that, but I'm always like, no, because veg is so good. I just, I can't miss it. So we'll have to go to both. Yeah. Yeah. You have to try them out. Let me know next time you're in the city too. I will do that. So a recent book, movie, or song that you like, you like to read. So do I. This is why I asked this question, but is there any recent book, movie, or song that's really on your mind? Yeah. I just watched a documentary and I forget what it was called, but it was really, really good. I was actually going to post about it, but I forgot what it was called. It was about two girls. It was a rape culture video and it was insane. And Anonymous got involved. Have you heard? Oh, I want to see it. It's on an, it's a Netflix original, Aubrey and Daisy. Anyone that's listening to this, watch that. Yeah. I'll post a link to it in the show notes too. Yes. That's it. That's it. It's uh, Audrey and Daisy and it's, it's new on Netflix and it's amazing. It's, it's like gripping. You can't stop watching this documentary slash it's more like a movie. It's not boring documentary. Go on. Documentaries aren't boring. (laughs) I love documentaries. I'm I'm trying to appeal to the public here. So yes. Okay. Um, do you like chocolate? I don't, I don't like sweet. I know. I like chocolate, but I do like the super bitter kind. It's like, ah, so it's not that sweet. Yeah, I'll have like cacao, like the, the bitter, dark, dark chocolate that's like $8 a bar at Whole Foods. Yeah, I'll have that once yeah. in a while, but I'm not a huge sweet. Do you have any tattoos? I do. I have a, a couple. What's your favorite one? Um, I think the elephant I have, just because of the fact that I love elephants and I got to spend some time in an elephant sanctuary and it was amazing. It reminds me of that. So who is your person? Do you have someone who's like your support, your rock? A person that you turn to often? A lot of people. Not like a vast amount of people, but I have a lot of people from different, I guess, little communities that I get to turn to depending on what support I need at that time. And I think that's really cool. And these people have sort of just aligned for me in a way that has been really natural. And I guess it's something as I get older that I appreciate. You know, my relationships with different people all, you know, make me the best person and help me to help that person as well. So, I guess I'm taking those more seriously as I age. Yeah, that's good. And the community aspect of it where there's more than one. I know who to turn to when you have this type of question, this type of question, this type of question. So it works. Well, that's good. That's the end of our final questions. Now I just do something at the end called one word unwords. And I did give you a little heads up about what this is about. But just for the listeners, I will give Lolly a word that starts with the prefix UN. And then she's going to tell us whatever comes to mind when I say it. So the first word is unusual. Whatever comes to mind, like anything that comes to mind when I say unusual. Good. Uncomfortable. Good. (laughs) Unkind. Hurting. Unspoken. Waiting to be spoken to. Was this supposed to be one word? No. Okay. No, because I tried it in my first episode. I'm like, I'll do this to myself because it's only fair. And I could not keep it to one word. And I'm like, say I'm really bad. Thank you for that. No, I'm like, I will not make my guests keep it to one word. So, okay. Unreal. Life. Uninhibited. Authentic. Undo. Redo. Unfold. Truth. Undecided. Forever. Unlucky. Not real. I'm really trying to pull the first word that comes out of my head, but like it was actually a blank for a second. I was like, unlucky. Yeah. Oh, right. Unlucky doesn't exist. No. (laughs) Okay. It's been so good talking to you, Lolly. I know I could go on forever, but I want to be conscious of your time. So would you mind just telling our listeners where they can find you on social media, how they can stay connected and get to know more about you and the Dignity Project and the work that you do? For sure. So I'm on Instagram at Real Humanist. That's where I post most of the stories. That's where I keep, I don't know, Instagram is kind of my, I'm a little, I don't know what your favorite is, but it's my, my, is it? Yeah. It's like, you get to skip a lot. Um, so real humanist on Instagram, then Facebook is I, I have a dignity project Facebook, but to be honest, I mostly post on my own personal page, which is Lolly Galvin. Great. Okay. All of you listening, I will post all the links to all the places that you can get in touch with Lolly and learn more about John and the other things that she's talked about in the show notes at untamedpodcast.com or on iTunes. And I'll also post links to the different things we talked about, the documentary 
and other subjects that we talked about where you can find more information and resources. Lolly, thank you for coming on the Untamed podcast. I so appreciate you. I love it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Untamed podcast and guest Lolly Galvin. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I have a feeling that Lolly and I won't just be online friends for very much longer. We don't live so far apart, and we already made some plans to go out for dinner and drinks the next time that my husband and I are in Philly. So I'm going to make it happen for sure. She's amazing. If you want to stay connected to her too, if you want to get involved in the work that she's doing and meet the people that she's meeting, then follow the links that will be in the show notes for how you can connect with her on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, and everywhere else that Lolly is doing amazing work in the world. I'd love to hear your feedback on today's show. So email, message, or social media comment me with questions and thoughts. And if again, if you want to be the first to know what's coming up for the Untamed podcast, sign up for the newsletter, join the Untamed Facebook group, get connected, get involved. I'm so very thankful for you, your listening ears, and your willingness to learn along with me as we relate to these amazing guests like Lolly. Until next time, I'm your host, Lou Urich, wishing you a wild week. <laughs>